Tonight on Joy News Prime President Ekufo the task Electoral Commission Chairperson to ensure the 2020 election is conducted in a transparent, credible and fair manner as he filed his nomination to contest. Parliament gives its full backing to efforts by the executive to rein in a person seeking to break off part of the Volta region from Ghana. The president, as commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, be assured that he has the full support of the House to deal decisively, ruthlessly with the threat. In the Volta region have meanwhile invoked cases on persons behind the secessionist movement in the region. Also in the central region, uh, police begin investigations into sale of subsidized outboard motors by some executives of the governing NPP. And in business, Chairman of the Finance Committee in Parliament says the controversial Ojapa deal has not been suspended. We have details coming shortly. And lawyers for Sin Central MP draw in running mate for the NDC flag bearer, Professor Nana Jinupukwajiman, in the case of contempt brought against the MP for comments made against High Court judge. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. The news is coming to you live from our studios in Kukumlimle here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Police in the central region uh, have begun investigations into the sale of subsidized outboard motors by some executives of the governing NPP in the region. This follows a complaint uh, lodged by the MCE from Fantaman against the constituency's second vice chairman, David Awache, who has been in indicted in an investigative report for using his late uncle's fishing canoe to buy the subsidized outboard motor at 10,000 cities to sell it off at 16,000. Freelance investigative reporter Manasseh Azuri Awene went undercover in the central region and reveals how some of the outboard motors got into wrong hands. Some fishermen in Elmina in August this year said party executives of the governing MPP had hijacked the machines and were selling them at prices higher than the subsidized price. <laughs> This is the Elimina Fishing Harbor in the central region. Some fishermen I've spoken to say business has gone very bad because of the activities of petrolers. They therefore find it very difficult to meet their operational cost and therefore welcomed the decision by the government to subsidize the machines they use for fishing. However, they say having access or getting some of the machines to buy at the subsidized cost is a problem. These allegations are widespread in the central region, but are often dismissed as untrue. I put a team together to go undercover to ascertain the veracity of these claims. The team came across people who were willing to sell the government subsidized outboard motors in Abuisi in the western region, and Mori, Brewa and Apam in the central region. Prices quoted ranged from 14,000 to 16,000 cities. At Brewa in the Enfansman municipality, we were led to the constituency women's organizer of the MPP, whom our sources said had some of the machines for sale. When we met her, she said she had sold hers, but directed us to a man who acted as a middleman for another seller of the subsidized machines. The middleman led us to where the machine was, and insisted that the cost of the machine was 16,000 cities and nothing less. This is a 40 horsepower Yamaha outboard motor my team and I have just bought from one David Awachi in Brewa in the central region here. These outboard motors have been subsidized by the government of Ghana and are meant to be sold to the fishermen. But some members of the governing New Patriotic Party have hijacked them and are selling at a higher price than the price that is supposed to have been sold to the fishermen. 
That machine belonged to the MPP constituency second vice chairman, David Awoche. When the sale was sealed, we requested a receipt and he wrote it on an MPP notepad. When I called David Awoche later, he told me he had used the details of his late uncle's canoe to secure the subsidized outboard motors, even though he wasn't a fisherman. <laughs> The canoe is faulty, so it had to be repaired. The money used to buy the outboard motor was borrowed with interest, so we decided to sell the outboard motor and repair the canoe. When I drew his attention to the issue, the Central Regional Minister, Kwame Nadanka, said he had instructed the Municipal Chief Executive of Mfansaman to act on the matter. Once this came to my notice immediately, I uh, got in touch with the municipal chief executive for him to give me the background to that. And he did indeed say that this person who has come on the radar, that uh, he's got one and has decided to uh, sell it over and above the, 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 the subsidized price, was indeed given one. But he was given one uh, meant for uh, relative fishermen. So I instructed that quickly uh, bring this uh, report uh, to the police and let the police go and pick him up. All right, so we'll be, we'll be going to the court um, shortly and also look at how the Asin Central MP's case uh, pan out with uh, my colleague uh, Joseph Akable with all the details. But before then, let's still stick with the fishermen uh, because some fishermen in the central region are calling on government to publish the names of recipients of the outboard motors it distributed to fishermen across the coastal regions of the country. This follows an investigation by freelance investigative journalist Manasseh Azuria Wene that revealed that the Infantiman constituency second vice chairman of the governing New Patriotic Party sold an output motto subsidized by government for fishermen at a higher price. At a news conference at Elmina on Tuesday, they chastised government for politicizing the fishery sector. Richard Kwejonyako has more. In August this year, after government, through the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture, distributed outboard motors to fishermen along Ghana's coastal regions at subsidized prices, some fishermen in the central region raised red flags accusing government of giving the outboard motors to party functionaries instead of fishermen. The 40 horsepower Yamaha outboard motors cost close to 20,000 on the market, but government gave the outboard motors to the fishermen at a subsidized price of 10,000 Ghana CDs. The canoe fishermen were supposed to register with details of their canoes and pay to the bank before being allocated the outboard motors. Investigative journalist Manasseh Azuria Winnie's expose that led to the arrest of second vice chairman of the MPP in the Infantman constituency, who is not a fisherman but got a subsidized outboard motor and sold it to the team of the, of the investigative journalists. The fishermen in the central region say they have vindicated when they said government outboard motors went to the wrong hands and not fishermen. They want government to account for all the outboard motors it distributed. John Quaison, popularly known as Manoma, speaks for the group of canoe owners. About two months ago, we held a news conference here to tell government that the outboard motors it says it has distributed to the fishermen, about 70% of it did not go to the fisher folks, but, but rather party supporters. Two supporters of the MPP organized a news conference to lambast us. Yesterday, we heard that a journalist has gone to buy an outboard motor from a party executive. Let's ask ourselves, what's the name of the canoe of the person who sold the outboard motor to the said journalist? We are by thus challenging government to mention the names of all the fishermen who claims it supplied the outboard motors to. If not, then it will be very clear that the president has nothing really to offer us fishermen, but came only for his party people. Whatever regional office, and what you be super good, we have no church. 
Some of the Albert motors were kept at the regional office and later distributed to the party people instead of bringing it to the communities to give to the fishermen. John Quaison and his group of fishermen say government has not dealt with them fairly and should show that it has the fishermen at heart. Richard Kwejunya Akon, Joy News, Cape Coast. Away right, from Cape Coast, lawyers for Asin Central MP Kennedy Japan has raised concerns over comments made by running mates for the NDC flag bearer, Professor Nana Jenopoku Ajeman, which, say, which they say puts undue pressure on the court. Professor Ajeman, while interacting with officials of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, called for the law to deal with the MP as was done in the case of the Muntier 3. Mr. Japan's lawyers on Tuesday raised the matter as they pushed to have the court grant them an in-camera hearing. Court correspondent Joseph Akable uh, was there for Joy News. If you say somebody has scandalized the, the law court and you allow the process to go through, the person is, has apologized, has done everything, you, the, the law took its course. The person was fined, the person was sentenced, the person is in prison. You say, okay, clemency. It is part of the judicial to apply for clemency. And people pretend they don't understand why there should be a petition. Another person does the same thing, also scandalizes the court and just says, oh, he's done to apologize, so it's okay. That is corruption. These remarks by the NDC's Professor Nana Jinopoku Ajiman formed part of the basis of the MP's lawyers push for an in-camera hearing. A member of the legal team, Afenyo Markin, said this puts pressure on the court and subjects it to what he called, quote, gallery interpretation, end quote. This was when Dr. Kenado, who has granted the MP a 14-day excuse duty, addressed the court. Justice Wooney, however, rejected the request for an in-camera hearing. The MP is to show up in court and defend comments he made, which the court considers as amounting to contempt. But the MP has so far been absent, his lawyers explaining his unwell. In a testimony lasting well over 60 minutes, Dr. Ado said the MP's condition was unusual. This, according to him, was because of a medication he placed the MP on for 14 days. He told the court this is what accounted for the excuse duty. Justice Wooney then raised issues with a document signed by the doctor. First was the fact that the document did not have an outpatient department number, aside from pointing out that the MP's age is not stated on the document, even though it provides for that. Dr. Ado first explained that he issued a note on an outpatient basis. This, he said, was after he had detained the MP on September 25 and discharged him on September 26. On the MP's age, the doctor said he opted to write adult just so his age is not noticed by anyone who sees the document. Justice Wooney pointed out that the MP is a public figure whose age is known. He added that he was surprised the age was not written even though the form required that it is written. Dr. Ado agreed with the judge. The medical doctor then stated further that he granted the MP 14 days without a review because it was necessary. While adjourning the case, Justice Wooney said, quote, as professionals, as much as possible in the interest of this dear nation of ours, we must do what is right ethical so as to lift this country to higher heights, end quote. The case has been adjourned indefinitely. Our report staff of the Ghana Airport Company Limited are threatening to lay down their tools in 14 days if the managing director is not removed. The staff in a petition have accused the MD Yao Kwakwa of mismanagement and other conduct they say are not in the best interest of the company, particularly outsourcing at exorbitant costs, key aspects of the company's operations that could be handled by internal units. Kwikwa Santi was at the airport earlier and reports there were red strips all over the premises. The Kutuka International Airport is red. Staff of the Ghana Airport Company Limited have clad most areas with red cloth to show their anger. According to the union, they want the managing director of the company, Mr. Yao Kwakwa, out for what they say is his gross neglect of the needs of the staff of the company. So as you can see behind me in your shorts, the Ghana Airport Company Limited, the staff are up in arms against the managing director of the company, Mr. Yaokwakwa. They are saying 
he should be removed by the president. They've actually sent a petition. I'm quoting, as leaders of the Divisional Workers Union represented the entire general staff body, we are convinced after engagement with our members at the headquarters and the regional airports that the only way to get the company back on its track and achieve the president's vision of making KIA an aviation hub in the sub-region is the removal of the managing director. Here is Abdul Isaac Abamba, leader of the Ghana Airport Company Limited Workers Union. Yes, and we have a lot of issues and uh, a lot of them bordered on uh, his lack of interest in the welfare of staff, the welfare of staff. So based on that, we, 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 we are not ready to work with him any longer. Now let me just reference you, this is not coming from only us, the union executives. Before this decision was taken, uh, the executives used almost two months to engage staff is not taking care of our welfare and we think that any good uh, 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 managing director the staff should be his number one assets now if he's not interested in the welfare of staff to the extent that even their health issues are not being taken care of we think he's not the best person to to, to manage the company the union confirms also that their demands are partly due to the purported move to privatize the company it cannot be they cannot be treated in isolation in fact when we add all these things together we can conclude that uh, he had a grand scheme of uh, running the company down and have a good reason to hand it over to the private people that's what we think the 14 days ultimatum to the president to dismiss the ghana airport company limited md expires in two days on thursday it is left to be seen what other action the staff will take to press home their demand but for now their stance remains that the MD has demonstrated gross incompetence and also a lack of critical understanding of the aviation industry, hence his continuous stay will derail the progress of the company. Some youth in the Asogli state in the Volta region have performed some rituals to invoke their gods and deities to strike dead the individuals behind the recent secessionist attacks in parts of the region. The youth condemned the attacks, lamenting its negative impact on the region. They backed the traditional authorities' offer to deploy warriors to complement efforts of the security agencies in dealing with the people behind the attacks. Addressing journalists at the Sogli Palace in Ho, convener of the youth, Nuti Fafa Degbo, extended an invitation to members of the Homeland Study Group, which distanced itself from the attacks, to join forces with them. By the Asogli Youth, dated Tuesday, 6th October 2020, on the raging issues of attack on the Volta region by suspected Western Tugulan separatist groups. It will be recalled that on the 29th of September 2020, exactly a week ago, the traditional leaders of Asogli State, like many other traditional leaders in the region, expressed their utmost disgust about the attack on our region, allegedly by Western Togoland separatist groups. This follows disturbances in the morning of road blockings and burning of lorry ties, attack on police stations and seizure of police vehicles and guns, and subsequently burning of the ST accusations from the government of Ghana. We, the Asogli youths and warriors, having analyzed the negative impact these disturbances could have on our region as regards to one, eroding investors' confidence, two, creation of anxiety and insecurity, three, wastage of scarce national resources on maintenance of security, four, disrupting in business, disruption in business and social activities, and five, threats to disruption of voting in the Volta region during the forthcoming December 7th election, among others. 
We therefore want to lend our fullest support to the call by our traditional leaders on the warriors to rise up and protect its citizens to complement the effort of the state security apparatus since Secretariat as foreigners. And the list continues. And from the Volta region to the OT region, because Minister, Regional Minister Kwesi Wusi is blaming political actors seeking to undermine the fortunes of the NPP administration for recent disturbances in the Volta region linked to separatists. He bases his claim on research he says shows PNDC and NDC administrations never encounter such disturbances. At a news conference Tuesday to distance the region from the activities of the group, the regional minister described the OT region as dreadfully anti togolanders There's more in the following report. The OT regional minister served as Volta regional minister under former president John Kufo's administration for eight years. Addressing the media in the region Tuesday, he said anyone pushing the secessionist agenda in the region is committing a serious offence and vowed that the security agencies will crush those elements. The time that these uh, incidents have taken place in our country, uh, in the past, these agitations were organized to coincide with the administration of the new patriotic party. The research has established that at no time during the PNDC administration, and subsequently the NDC administration, did we experience such a, a disturbing incident. On the contrary, any time that the new patriotic party uh, came into government, you have this agitation taking place. He said the forebears of the region fought so hard for its split from the Volta region because they believed it would bring badly needed development, but not to become a unitary state. We are on top of security. We are prepared to adopt proactive and preemptive measures. We are not going to wait until there is any serious disturbance in OT. We know, considering our location, if this thing is happening in Volta, then it will seem that we are also vulnerable. And back here in Parliament, uh, Parliament has thrown its support behind the executive to deal decisively with attempts by secessionists to declare an independent Western Togoland. Minority leader Harun Idrisu told MPs on the first day of sitting following seven-week break, the president can, rest, can be rest assured the House supports efforts to keep a united country. We all must work to preserve the peace, the stability, and the unity of our country. So whilst welcoming members with the speaker, there is an ugly threat to the stability, sovereignty, and territory of Ghana in the Volta region. The president, as commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, be assured that he has the full support of the House to deal decisively, ruthlessly with the threat to the sovereignty and integrity of our country. We cannot afford a disunited Ghana. I'm sure he is uh, campaigning to lead a united country, just as Excellency John Dramani Mahama is campaigning to lead a united country. Majority Leader Seche Mensa Bunsu says he hopes no member of parliament is behind the agenda to split Ghana. The speaker, the minority leader, has spoken to the unfortunate incidents happening in the water region. I don't want to believe that any of us here will buy into that agenda. This country has had a referendum in, 19, in 1992 and resolves as a nation that we will live together in unity and will resolve to also protect the stability of this country. Clarion call should go to all of us. It should go to all of us here in assembled as members of parliament. That that collective resolve, which.
happened when we conducted the referendum that approved the 1992 constitution still holds. And we should not allow any individuals with ulterior motives to take this nation to the brink. We must live in unity, we must live in stability, we must live as a collective, as a speaker, as a former head of state, General I.K. Echampon used to say, this is our country, we are one people with a common destiny. And so to come in business, Chairman of Parliament's Finance Committee says the Japamino royalties deal is not suspended as has been suggested in some media reports. It takes time from the start, the launch of an IPO to the conclusion of, of it. So, yes, government has pulled the bricks, but the deal is not off. There is more when we return with business. Hello there, it's time for business. I'm Charles Aite. Chairman of Parliament's Finance Committee, Dr. Mark Esibayibwa, is disputing claims by the Foreign Affairs Minister that a directive by the, engine, that, that the Bank of Ghana's embassy in Belgium to close its accounts due to European unions. But away from that particular you know, issue, of course, the head of uh, the Finance uh, you know, Committee in Parliament has also stated that the controversial Japan deal has not been suspended. Despite various concerns raised by the special prosecutor, he says government is going to be given given in to the various processes needed of which would rake in much more investor confidence. Listen to him speak at the floor of parliament. It couldn't have been far from the truth because it takes time from the start, the launch of an IPO to the conclusion of, of it. So yes, government has pulled the bricks, but the deal is not off. Now, I was talking to your colleague on the finance committee. Uh, Joint dinner for. Because the opinion, the signs were not good in the first place. Uh, government is suspending the issuance of the IPO because the market wouldn't have responded positively. That's why I'm telling you that the, the deal has not been suspended per se. What has happened is that the Office of the Special Prosecutor has asked for the production of documents and also is conducting a corruption risk assessment to see if government met all the requirements before it launched the IPO. In the face of that, it will be foolhardy to go ahead when such a serious office is conduct, uh, conducting a corruption risk assessment. So um, <laughs> the people who hold Ghana paper, those who subscribe to our euro bonds and such, they always stand ready to buy um, uh, our bonds and, and, uh, and such. So I don't think it would have suffered anyway. Now, the total number of bounce checks submitted by businesses and individuals to financial institutions recorded some significant increase for last year. It went up by 36% to hit almost 40,000 cases. Now, this was contained in the latest Bank of Ghana's report credit reference and activity for 2019. There is more in this report. This came to light as the financial institutions that were giving these checks by persons that had no monies in their account However, they were required to pass on this information to the credit reference bureaus. Almost 40,000 checks given to banks in 2019 represented a 36% jump in terms of what was presented to them in 2018. It was supposed to come with some fines and sanctions, but it was not clear in the report whether the banks did exercise this function. Well, a breakdown of the numbers also revealed that a little over 23,000 checks were issued by institutions with the remaining coming from individuals. In terms of searches, savings and loans companies top the list of institutions that tend to these credit reference bureaus for information on individuals seeking for credit from their end. According to the Bank of Ghana, the increasing request by these savings and loans companies was due to the number of payroll lending that they were offering to their customers in this space. The data showed that more than 2 million searches were made by all the financial institutions for individuals and businesses seeking credit from their end. The report 
report also showed that the number of complaints and disputes received at the credit reference bureaus from customers went up by 71% to hit 4,763. This was as a result of customers that had issues with the credit reports that were submitted by the banks which affected their ability to secure credit. According to the Bank of Ghana, the increase in activity in this credit reference space shows that a greater number of lenders are seeing the real benefit and not just because they are using it because of regulatory compliance. There are currently three credit reference bureaus in the country. Well, Ghana has been chosen among four other African countries to benefit from a $5 billion uh, global stimulus package. Now, the post-COVID-19 rebuilding effort in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program and the Ministry for Business Development, Sector Minister Dr. Ibrahim Awa announced that Ghana is one in four countries to benefit from this package. The comprehensive report indicates that both consumer and business confidence are rising after the further easing of COVID-19 restrictions. This affirms the Bank of Ghana's recent survey that the pace of economic activities are picking up whilst business and consumer confidence are increasing. Having experienced a mild contraction in the second quarter of this year, the report said the economy is likely to gather pace as evidenced by the recent high-frequency data for the third quarter of this year. This will result in a gross domestic product growth of 1.3%, making Ghana an outperformer in the sub-Saharan African region. The economy contracted by 3.2% in the second quarter of this year, a situation fetched solutions described as a minor contraction. It further added that the contraction was shallow and compares favorably with the deeper contractions witnessed in South Africa and Nigeria. William Atwell is a senior country risk analyst in the sub-Saharan African team of Fitch Solutions. And that was the Fitch report there, rating Ghana as the highest in sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to its economic growth. Away from that, oil marketing company Gat Oil has inaugurated an eight-member board with the aim of combating the sale of contaminated fuel and expand operations in dominant mining areas. There is more in this report. Board Chair of the OMC, Prof. Kwame Bosiaku Omani Enchi, tells Joy Business the new board will also engage the government on ethical practices OMCs in the country must adopt in order to redeem trust and confidence in the sector. The board stands for ethical business. And we want to make sure that God Oil actually operates ethically. I mean, we want Gadoy to be what I call a good corporate citizen. And therefore, when it comes to contaminated food and whatnot, we are going to be resolute in our decisions regarding that. Gat Oil, a family-owned OMC, resorted for this move to constitute a board citing the benefits of corporate governance. Managing Director Emmanuel Gatti explained the company meant nothing without a board. As concerns over price fixing and contaminated fuel surges, Mr. Gatti intimated that customers precede parochial interests. And you know, corporate governance without board of what we are doing might not be the right thing. So we are looking to the future and that things will be okay for the company. In terms of pricing, how competitive is Gat Oil? We are competitive. If you look at the price across this stretch of road, you see that our price is moderate for the customers. Gat Oil is also looking to expand their frontiers. By way of business for this edition, stay with us for more in the subsequent editions. Many thanks for watching. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the first segment of the sports here on the Joy News Prime with me, Oreko Ampofo. And we start off from the biggest story today, and that has to do with former GFA boss, Chrissy Nantichi. And the news coming in is that his life ban has now been reduced to 12 years, and uh, we should be seeing that story right on the screens at this moment. Uh, but it follows with the details that the, co the Court of Arbitration for Sport has reduced Chrissy Nantichi's life ban to 12 years, according to our partner station, HRI FM. Now, the ban has been reduced following a successful appeal by the former Ghana uh, Football Association boss. 
Now, FIFA banned an entity for life for breaking bribery and corruption rules in 2018. And according to FIFA, he also broke some conflict of interest rules. Now, aside the ban, he was also fined 500,000 Swiss francs. That equates to 390,000 pounds. And uh, an entity was also pictured, uh, you know, taking 65,000 worth of bribe uh, in that undercover report uh, by Anas Arimeyao titled number 12. Now, at the end of Nantichi's time, uh, you know, he was probably one of the most powerful football figures, and he was a vice president of the Confederations of African Football and a member of the FIFA Council as well. He was also the Ghana Football Association president and the West African Union president also. He did resign from all these positions before the ban was imposed on him by the World Football Governing Body. And uh, that's how the story stands on now. At first, it was a life ban, but now it has been reduced to 12 years after that cover arbitration to hear him out. Uh, we'll be finding out if there are any further updates as to whether Kwesi Nantiji accepts this or he still believes that the time probably could be cut to less. Uh, but still staying on some Ghana stories. And this time, we go all the way to North London, where yesterday, Thomas Partey did headline Transfer Deadline Day with his move to Arsenal. But the big question remains as to how he would fit in in Mikel Arteta's setup. And we've been speaking to former Manchester City midfielder Nigel de Jong, who thinks the Ghanaian would slot very well with the Premier League side. Speaking of Thomas Partey, we do have a big surprise for you. As at 10.30, we'll be bringing you an exclusive interview with his father as to what his thoughts are concerning the move. Uh, so do keep an eye out on the Joy News channel. Uh, but also regarding Thomas Partey, we know that he'll be joining the Black Stars camp later this week after completing his Arsenal deal. But one player who may not be available is Mohamed Kudus. Now, it's been a bit tricky after the release of the Ghanaian player because Ajax did announce that he's been injured and missed out the league game. So due to that, he would not be able to come to Black Stars uh, you know, for the international uh, break as well. But then the, Black, the Ghana Football Association sorry, asked that Kudus travels to Turkey so that they do their own medical assessment on Tuesday. So uh, apparently, you know, Kudus did not turn up for the medical assessment. And reports coming in from the Netherlands suggest that Ajax are not going to release any of their African players due to fear that they might contract COVID and that they are just trying to protect their players. And footage is coming in from today's training. So Kudu's training with the squad. So it leaves a lot of question marks as to whether he is really fit or whether he's really hurt. But one thing that we know is that it looks very, very likely that he might not be playing for the Black Stars when they face Mali and Qatar in Turkey. We're bringing you updates on that story as well. So keep an eye out on our social media platforms at Joy Sports GH as well. My name is Oreko Wampofu, and that's the sports for now. Showbiz Becky is here with the very latest. Hello to you, Aisha. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good, Becky. Uh, um, I'm fantastic. Let's, when was the last time you heard from uh, Trigmatic, rapper Trigmatic? It's been a while, and yeah. um, I'm hearing that uh, there's something coming up. Yeah. So he's uh, releasing, he's working actually on videos for uh, his latest album. Hmm. Yeah, and he's been having a conversation with us. So that was Rob Patrick Matic. We uh, can't wait for uh, those videos, yeah. Aisha. Uh, but Aisha, do you know that? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that by this time you've heard that Davido is in town and he's working course, on something with Stone Of course, Boy. of Yeah, course. so congratulations. I personally can't wait. I can't wait, you know, to, for, Becky. For that particular song. My goodness. And so, but, uh, just, you know, basically that's what we're expecting. A lot of things happened. Davido came out. <laughs> uh, there, were, uh, there, were, there were news that uh, and, and I'm bounced. sure if there was no COVID we would, would have I mean been lucky to attend the concert yeah. by Davido which I wouldn't miss anyway yeah yeah, yeah. but but what we won't miss Aisha is, is the, the collab yeah that we don't even have name for but we know that this collaboration is fire Definitely. And we definitely, can't we'll definitely wait. Look out for yes. It. So, uh, American uh, rapper Trey Songs, uh, he's he's tested positive for COVID nineteen. Looks like COVID nineteen is not going anytime soon. I shall. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the figures coming from the U.S. and Spain, mm. Germany, um, 
it's scary yeah anyway. so uh we wish uh Trey song all the best uh let's move away from Trey song let's talk about uh, the m music industry so mm -hmm. chris Yenes, he is an entertainment pundit he's okay. saying that uh, uh, we shouldn't downplay the roles of managers and record labels yeah. in ghana he spoke on hit fm the moment you're able to use that language promoted <laughs> that's the work now that is the work that is what a lot of these mini million musicians including the one who even called you this morning when you were doing an interview that is the work of all these people <laughs> what does promotion do in the life of an artist mm. promotion gives you visibility yes. it, it is the one that, it is the engine that brings revenue mm. it is the engine of growth for any musician in the world yes. an artist need promotion what do you want you want to do construction <laughs> no, as an artist, what do you want to do? You want to do construction? <laughs> no, that's the thing. Or you want to do farming? A musician after recording, you need that thing. You need that visibility, a high point visibility that will blow your craft to the world. Yeah. And thank you, Becky, for bringing us time, to showbiz. That will be it for those of you watching on Joy Prime. The news continues on Joy. And in 62 days to elections, this is your election headquarters where to stay for everything elections. Now, the majority leader has urged politicians not to behave as if the 2020 election is a do or die affair. Osei Chairman Sabunsu insists the Electoral Commission is on course to deliver a good election. Um, on December 7th, the institution that is charged with the conduct of the elections has given all assurances that they are going to ensure a smooth conduct of elections, elections that will be peaceful, that will be transparent, that will be free and fair. The authorities, the president has also assured that whatever it takes to make these elections peaceful, the executive is going to assure and indeed ensure that. The speaker, men and women of goodwill must urge the commission to do what is needful and appropriate. But it will be most unpatriotic to resort to scaremongering, as some people are trying to do, as if this is the first election that this country is going to have. The speaker, we have had several elections. Sometimes we must admit we push ourselves a bit to the brink. But Ghana has survived. And we must count on the goodwill and the good conscience of all of us to do what is right. But not to be unnecessarily engaged in scaremongering as if the heavens are going to cave in on us. It's not true what needs to be done, however, must be done by all of us as a collective. The audit service has written to Parliament explaining its inability to submit to the House the 2019 Auditor General's report on time is due to COVID-19 pandemic. The Constitution requires that in a maximum of six months into the a year, the report is submitted to Parliament. But then 10 months into 2020, the 2019 report is yet to be submitted to the House. The minority at a media briefing claims the delay is an attempt by the Kufuado administration to cover up corruption. But Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, told MPs the AG has communicated to the House the delay is due to COVID-19. Honourable members, for further information, I have received a letter from the Auditor General, which I will refer appropriately to the two leaders. Which states that it reminds on it refers to certain delays in submitting audited accounts to Parliament, which are the subject of some comments. It states in clear terms that the delay is not deliberate in any way whatsoever. We 
the arrival of the COVID, several institutions, including their office, were adversely affected as known to the public, and that the office will continue to fulfill its constitutional duties. Copies have been made available to the majority and minority leaders accordingly, and we will take note. Away from Parliament, President Ekufuado has taxed the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jen Mensah, to ensure the 2020 general elections are conducted in a transparent, credible and fair manner, declaring he doesn't want to be the beneficiary of a crooked election. He made these comments Tuesday as he filed his nomination at the Electoral Commission's office. Express some misgivings about the processes. You just also mentioned in there that you don't want to be elected in any crooked um, election. Do you trust the processes so far, as has been exhibited? Unless you have some kind of hidden agenda, anybody can doubt the fairness of the processes that have so far we are all witnesses to the process. And I think that all serious minded lawyers are clear that we are witnessing the process. There are some who are investing in trying to discredit the process for their own sectarian ends. I'm not going to the AC says it has set up two technical teams to validate nomination forms of aspiring candidates for the December 7 elections. We are gathered here to kickstart one of the most important activities in the lead up to the December 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. Indeed, without this activity, the commission cannot run the election. And here I'm referring to the filing of nominations by presidential candidates who are seeking to contest the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Regulation 7 of CI 127 enjoins a presidential candidate to complete and sign four copies of the nomination form. Additionally, the forms shall be signed by no less than two persons who are registered voters in the area of authority of each district assembly. The president is required to designate a person to serve as his or her vice president. Furthermore, he or she is required to deliver the forms on a date agreed by the political parties. And Earlier one time, independent presidential candidate Jacob Oseyebua filed nomination forms on behalf of presidential aspirant Alfred Kwame Walker. Uh, Ghana Union Movement uh... Flag bearer of the Ghana Union Movement, Christian Kwabena Andrews, a popularly known as Sofo Chirabusum, has charged chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Madame Jane Mensa, to prove her neutrality in the upcoming December polls. According to him, the credibility of the December polls is largely dependent on the conduct of the commission adding the ec must desire to clear the perceived bias against some political parties he said this after submitting his nomination forms to contest the december election this is uh, uh, setting the ball rolling you know everything that you need to start with a, a step it's a, a step that we have it's a test step because the first one was to give us a, a first certificate a second certificate and now they are receiving our a filing, a nomination, everything. I think it is a step to a victory for us in this 2020 election. And uh, definitely we are going to beat NDC and MPP and they will not come to power. No, we'll come to NDC and MPP, but the question I'm asking is, I mean, you raised a concern about the credibility of the Electoral Commission. Yeah. Do you get the sense that the EC is biased or impartial? Uh, that is what has been in the in the whole realm that people have been talking about these things uh their ec bosses are not, are not all that uh, truthful they, they they are people that they always support the party that brought them to to the seat and uh, that is what i was alerting them that they should be very careful uh, to just be a fair play for all of us so that uh, uh, 
Ghanaians are going to prove themselves. So what is your own independent assessment of this population? In actual sense, it's good. They have done well. Uh, that is why even uh, once I came after the, uh, the registration, I came and congratulated them okay. uh, because they did well. Uh, I thought as it started, everybody was uh, this very hooliganism that started everything. That I thought maybe there's going to be a trouble in the country, but they did it well and nothing happened. That's why I give them that very applause and uh, I'm expecting them to do the same as we are entering into the final election. Time now for business. We'll be back shortly. In business tonight, about 3,800 farmers in the Gushigu municipality have benefited from the farming services provided by the Outgra Business Network, OB Network, a farmer based organization. Now, the service included land preparation, threshing, marketing, and farming inputs. There is more in this report. The 16 outgrower associations grow maize, soya, rice, cowpea, and granuts. The aim of the program is to increase production of these crops. Speaking to Joy Business after a cleanup exercise in the Gushegu Municipal Hospital, chairman of the OB Network, Alhasa Mumuni Baba, said the network's purpose is also to promote and protect members' business and ensure sustainability. The whole network, we have 16 members. And each member has OGs. OGs means outgrowers. He has smallholder farmers under them. So in the network, with that system members, we have over 3,000 outgrowers who are behind us. That is the smallholder farmers. We have over 3,000 of them. Each and every year, we farm for them. We provide farm, farming services to those outgrowers. Now, plant protectionists and agric scientists at the University of Cape Coast are bemoaning the effect of COVID-19 that has reduced the importation of poultry feed and other protein needs of the country. There is more in this report. The current research in collaboration with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture is aimed at producing high-yielding, diseases-resistant and drought-tolerant varieties of the soya bean. Apart from the aforementioned qualities in the breeding lines of the soya bean varieties being worked on by the university, the investors are sharing the varieties would be climatically adaptable. Lead investigator on the project, Professor Aaron Tete Asari, says Ghana needs to up its production in soya bean, especially as the COVID-19 pandemic has reduced the importation of soya bean products. He fears the poultry industry could suffer as a result if Ghana does not take urgent steps to produce its own soya beans to support the poultry industry and the country's protein needs. Because of the COVID-19 currently, um, most of the soya bean that is being imported could not be, especially in um, uh, developing uh, fish meal and then poultry farming. So we need to um, come out with improved varieties and that would um, be cultivated by farmers to enable them to expand their farms and then to have the requisite yield in order to supplement you know, um, the food um, sources for animals. And soybean, because of its uh, protein dense, uh, is very important for uh, uh, poverty endemic areas where families cannot afford adequate protein in the diet. So by consuming um, soya bean, we will have the requisite protein nutrients in the diet. And children will not suffer from uh, kosher core and other malnourished uh, uh, diseases. In fact, the scientists um, at the university with other partners have also been working on numerous cowpea varieties that have helped farmers and supported in the food security of the country. A co-collaborator and plant protectionist, Professor Alves Asarabidiako, discusses the other key focus of the research. This project is also trying to look at the adaptability of some copy varieties that we are trying to breed, we are developing, and see how they can adapt to the coastal savanna, the forest and transitional zone. Soybean is grown in Ghana, basically uh, mainly uh, concentrated at the northern part, in other words, the savanna region. And you want to assess the adaptability of this uh, soybean 
in uh, the, the, the coastal savanna, the forest, the transitional zone. The farmers selected the breeding lines of the soya bean being developed to cultivate in their farms and give feedback to the researchers to inform them what their picks of the varieties would be. Richard Kwejo Joy News, Cape Coast. That'll be it for this edition of Business Sports is up next. And time now for sports and we'll be linking with uh, Nathaniel Arthur, the man who loves sports for the second uh, part of uh, this uh, sports uh, because uh, barely 24 hours of airing our latest hotline documentary boxing loan, government has started processing to pay back $45,000 owed DK Poison and of course Nathaniel Atto is uh, with him right now. He'll be telling us how he feels about this whole thing. Um, Nathaniel Atto joins me shortly with sports. Three, two, one, go. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Aisha. And um, we're coming to you live from the residence of the legendary DK Poison, Ghana's uh, first world champion. Uh, well, of course, the name in his passport is uh, David Kote. But of course, due to his exploits as, uh, you know, a legend of the sport, which is winning the first global silverware for Ghana in any sport across board, um, he got his nickname, uh, DK Poison, through his exploits in the sport of boxing. Now, um, we've been talking uh, all the, all these weeks, um, you know, ahead of the, the airing of the documentary last night, as you rightly said, and um, by the good grace of God, the presidency has announced that uh, an amount of forty-five thousand dollars that is owed him will be paid back to him on humanitarian grounds. So um, we paid him a visit today, uh, as we've always done over this period, and uh, would just like to have his reaction, his initial reaction to all of this. All right, so. Um, Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Just fine. Just fine. Just fine. Can, can you tell me how you marked your 20th anniversary? It was on the 20th of September. The, 45, the 40, 45th anniversary. Yes. I couldn't know. I couldn't mark it because you know, you know, due to some circumstances beyond my control. You know, I should have. Yeah, I couldn't mark it. How's the family doing, though? Oh, pretty fine, pretty fine. You know. Now, tell me about um, your your reaction first of all to everything that you've seen, you know, um, in the space um, since we we had our conversations and since we put the documentary together. Uh, I just can't explain. It. There's no way to to explain it because it, it, it's just fantastic, you know. I haven't seen that. You know, the way manner, you know, you documented the whole thing. It's, it's like a it's like a magic, <laughs> honestly. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like a magic. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um, what would you say as your reaction to the presidency for for what has been done? A letter has been written by the secretary to the president directing that the money be paid you and the, the finance ministry start work immediately on it. What what would you say? I heard, I heard the news around about 11 o'clock or so, and I was very overwhelmed because it's like a dream. You know, I've known between you. Know, you know it. it. It has taken a long time before this thing. Uh, I don't have I don't have much to share. The only thing I can say, I uh, thank the president, His Excellency, Nanado Dankwa Akufuado, thank him very, very much you know, for his kindness. And I wish him well, you know, yeah, just short word. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, that's it, Aisha, from here in Teshinungwa, from the residence of the legendary DK Poison, who's marking 45 years of annexing Ghana's very first global silverware in sport. Of course, um, we brought the first part of the documentary uh, last night. It's going to continue later tonight. And so you've heard it from the legend himself. And uh, he's uh, said everything that he has to say. And that surely will be final. Um, my name is Nathaniel Atto, and I have love for sport. Back to you in the studio, Aisha. Of course, Nathaniel has love for sports. But that documentary, The Boxing Loan, is at 8.30 after the news. Of course, you have to uh, make a date and stay on the Joy News channel. But for more news, log on to myjoyonline.com for all the updates. Stay on the Joy News channel. <laughs> Thank you.